Good morning, friends. On a cold day shortly before Eisenhower's inauguration, Smith summoned Kermit Roosevelt for a gruff conversation about Iran. Smith had supported the idea of a coup during the Truman administration, but his superiors overruled him. Now he was eager to proceed. It had been two months since Woodhouse's visit to Washington, and Smith was losing patience. When are those fucking British coming to talk to us, Smith demanded. And when is our goddamn operation going to get underway? Roosevelt assured him that everyone was ready, but it would be unseemly to move before Eisenhower was inaugurated. Pull up your socks and get going, Smith told him. You won't have any trouble in London. They'll jump at anything we propose. And I'm sure you can come up with something sensible enough for Foster to okay. Ike will agree. Eisenhower was inaugurated on January 20th, 1953. Days later, the American ambassador in Tehran, Roy Henderson, began contacting Iranians he thought might be interested in working to overthrow Mossadegh. Like his new bosses in Washington, Henderson had given up hope for a compromise. In one cable to Washington, he described Mossadegh as lacking in stability, clearly dominated by emotions and prejudices, and not quite sane. In another, he asserted that the National Front was composed by the street rabble, the extreme left, extreme Iranian nationalists, some but not all, some but not all of the more fanatical religious leaders and intellectual leftists, including many of who had been ed educated abroad and did not realize that Iran was not ready for democracy. He and George Middleton, his British counterpart, took the extraordinary step of composing a joint message to their home office expressing their shared conclusion that the longer Mossadegh remained in power, the likelier it was that Iran would fall to communism. Through an emissary, Henderson even opened a channel to General Zahedi, who he told Dahl in a cable was not ideal but had more chance of piloting Iran through the turbulent days following Mossadegh's, re Mossadegh's resignation than any other candidate now on the horizon. Zahedi had assured Henderson that if he, re if he reached power, he would take a strong stand toward the communists. He added, however, that it would be impossible for Iranians to remove the present government by their own efforts. Henderson sent a cable to Washington endorsing this view. It was received with great enthusiasm, so much so that Beetle Smith gave it to Eisenhower with a cover note calling it very accurate. Smith also sent a reply to Henderson telling him that the United States had decided it could no longer approve of the Mossadegh government and would prefer a successor government. He sent copies of his cable to CIA headquarters in Washington and to the CIA station in Iran. It amounted to a formal, though secret, declaration of war on Mossadegh. Only one important figure in the Eisenhower administration still hoped for compromise with Mossadegh, President Eisenhower himself. Two weeks before his inauguration, he met with Churchill in New York, and did not seem at all interested when Churchill mentioned Iran. In fact, he complained that Britain's efforts to involve the United States in its Iranian troubles had done nothing but get Mossadegh to accuse us of being a partner in browbeating a weak nation. Churchill was wise enough not to press his case at that moment. He knew that planning for a coup was already well underway, and <laughs> that the Dulles brothers were on his side. In February, he dispatched C, the chief of British intelligence, Sir John Sinclair, to Washington to convey the intensity of his interest. While Sinclair was in Washington, Iranian tribal leaders who were on the British payroll, working with General Zahedi, launched a short-lived uprising in the south southern provinces. Mossadegh suspected the Shah was involved and suggested that he consider leaving Iran until passions cooled. By all accounts, including his own, the Shah was more, will more than willing to go. Minister, Minister of Court Hussein Allah described him as being in almost hysterical state and on the brink of a complete nervous breakdown and irrational action. Mossadegh's foreign-sponsored enemies, however, cleverly turned news of the Shah's planned trip to their advantage. In sermons, street corner speeches, and newspaper articles, they charged that Mossadegh was forcing the Shah to leave against his will and that his next step would certainly be to abolish the monarchy. They organized a mob to, con a mob to converge on Mossadegh's house on the night of February 28th. As the crowd swelled in size, a jeep carrying an army, an army colonel, and one of the most colorful gang leaders in Tehran, Shaban, the, the, the brainless Jafari, smashed through the front gate. Mossadegh, in his pajamas, was forced to flee over his back garden wall. A British diplomat cabled home that the mob was certainly organized by Kashani, and was not a spontaneous expression of a loyalty deep-seated or significant enough to stiffen the Shah. But the next afternoon, Tehran was quiet again partly because the Shah had announced that he was cancelling his travel plans. The sudden appearance of a paid mob and its willingness to attack the Prime Minister, however, contributed to an atmosphere of growing instability. 
It also gave coup planners more ammunition for their campaign to persuade Eisenhower that Iran was sliding dangerously toward chaos. Neither Eisenhower nor anyone in his inner circle ever wrote on the account of how he came to support the idea of a coup. Evidence suggests, however, that he did so during March, two months after his inauguration. The Dole's brothers seized on the violence that erupted in Tehran on February 28th. Even Ambassador Henderson acknowledged that the protest had been organized rather than genuine, but evidently no one told that to Eisenhower. Instead, Alan Dole sent him an intelligence estimate warning that the Iran situation had been slowly disintegrating and a communist takeover was becoming more and more a possibility. <laughs> it was not an easy sell. At a meeting of the National Security Council on March 4th, Eisenhower wondered aloud why it wasn't possible to get some of the people in these downtrodden countries to like us instead of hating us. Secretary of State Doles did not reply directly, but he delivered a sobering analysis of the situation in Iran. His words, as reported by the official note-taker, suggested that the United States could no longer stand by without acting. The probable consequences of the events of the last few days, concluded Mr. Doles, would be a dictatorship in Iran under Mossadegh. As long as the latter lives, there, is li there was little danger. But if he were to be assassinated or removed from power, a political vacuum would occur in Iran, and the communists might easily take over. The consequences of such a takeover were then outlined in all their seriousness by Mr. Doles. Not only would the free world be deprived of the enormous assets represented by Iranian oil production and reserves, but the Russians would secure these assets, and thus henceforth be free from any anxiety about their petroleum situation. Worse still, Mr. Dulles pointed out, if Iran succumbed to the communists, there was little doubt that in short order, the other areas of the Middle East, with some 60% of the world's oil, oil reserves, would fall into communist control. Later that week, Foreign Secretary Eden visited Washington at several of his, of his top-level meetings. Eden broached the subject of Iran and proposed the coup. He found everyone except Eisenhower sympathetic. Alton Jones, the oil executive who had traveled to Iran the years before, was a personal friend of Eisenhower's, and Eisenhower told Eden that he wanted to send Jones back to make the best arrangement he could to get the oil flowing again. He and his considered he said he considered Mossadegh the only hope for the West in Iran, precisely the view Truman had held. I would like to give the guy ten million bucks, Eisenhower told the surprised Eden. Eden tried gently to change Eisenhower's mind telling him at one point that we would be better occupied looking for alternatives to Mossadegh rather than trying to buy him off. In the best diplomatic tradition, however, he left the real work to the intelligence officers who he had brought with him. While he spoke softly at the White House, they were honing their plot with comrades at the CIA and the State Department. The Dole's brothers had developed an excellent sense of how to bring their boss around to their way of thinking. On March 7th, John Foster Dole's and Eden issued a joint communique saying they had agreed on a new offer that would allow Iran to retain control of its own oil industry and of its own oil policies. That sounded fine to Eisenhower, but it did not honestly reflect the offer itself, which, like every other one the British had made over the past two years, was based on the premise that they would return to run the Iranian oil industry. Mossadegh rejected it and told Ambassador Henderson that he was disappointed that the Eisenhower administration had allowed the United Kingdom to formulate United States policy policies concerning Iran. He made several counter-proposals, even offering at one point to submit to mediation by Switzerland or Germany, but the British and their new friends in Washington ignored them. While Eden was in Washington, the Rashidian brothers were doing their best to stir up trouble in Iran. Partly through their efforts, prominent figures who had been part of Mossadegh's coalition began to turn against him. Ayatollah Kashani, the most outspoken defector, damned Mossadegh with the vitriol he had once reserved for the British. He began using things to intimidate his rivals, and even pushed a bill through the Mashlis pardoning Khalil Tamasibi, the convicted assassin of Prime Minister Razmara. Other former Mossadegh allies who broke with him their, to pursue other former Mossadegh allies who broke with him to pursue their own agendas, including Musafar Baki, Baki Bakai, head of the worker-based Toilers Party, and Hussein Makai, who had helped lead the takeover of the Abadan refinery and was at one point considered Mossadegh's heir apparent. Robin Zayner wrote in a report to London that the successful effort to pull Kashani, Bakai, and Maki away from the National Front was created and directed by the brothers Rashidian. These defections greatly weakened the National Front and left Mossadegh isolated and vulnerable. 
They also immeasurably strengthened the Dulles brothers in their effort to persuade President Eisenhower that the time had come for the United States to act. At a National Secretary Council meeting on March 11th, Secretary of State Dulles asserted that Americans must become senior partners with the British in this area. Eisenhower expressed no disagreement. The president said that he had very real doubts whether, even if we tried unilaterally, we could make a successful deal with Mosaddegh. The note-taker at the meeting reported. He felt that it might not be worth the paper it was written on, and the example might have grave grave effects on United States oil concessions in other parts of the world. Eisenhower had come to the conclusion that Iran was collapsing, and that the collapse would have not be prevented as long as Mosaddegh was in power. He stopped inquiring about the prospects for compromise. Those around him took his change in tone as a sign that he would not resist the idea of a coup. On March 18th, Frank Wisner sent a message to his British counterpart saying that the CIA was now prepared to discuss the details of a plot against Mosaddegh. Two weeks later, Alan Dulles approved the dispatch of $1 million to the CIA station in Tehran for use in any way that would bring about the fall of Mosaddegh. These developments greatly encouraged the British. During April, the Foreign Office formally embraced Operation Ajax, then what amounted to explicit recognition that command was passing from their hands to the Americans. British agents sent word to the Rashidian brothers that they would now show work with the CIA. Iranians connected to the, to the Rashidian network decided that they could push Iran further toward chaos by kidnapping high government officials. They preferred targets. Their preferred targets, Foreign Minister Fatemi and General Raihi, the newly appointed chief of staff, traveled with too many bodyguards, so they settled on the Tehran police chief, General Mohammed, Gen, General Mahmoud of Spartus. Some of the plotters had personal ties to Aspartis and one invited the chief to his home on April 19th. There he was seized, blindfolded, and spirited to a cave outside the town. Police officers identified the kidnappers almost immediately, but as soon as the officers closed in, one of Spartus' captors shot and killed him. This murder had the desired effect. It shocked the country and also eliminated a popular officer who might have been a formidable obstacle to the success of the forthcoming coup. General Zahedi, who had resurfaced with, after treason charges, charges against him had, were dropped, was implicated in the killing. He took refuge in the mash, Mashlis under Ayatollah Kashani's protection. Oy. Unaware of how decisively the Americans had turned against him, Mozadeg next decided to appeal directly to Eisenhower. In a letter dated May 28th, he said that Iranians were suffering financial hardships and struggling with political intrigues carried on by the former oil company and the British government. They would be deeply grateful for prompt and effective aid from the United States or for American support for a stalled $25 million loan that Mosaddegh was seeking from the Export-Import Bank, or at least for permission to sell oil to American companies. Eisenhower took a month to reply. When he did, it was to suggest that Mosaddegh could best repair Iran's, Iran's economy by resolving his dispute with the British. The failure of Iran and the United Kingdom to reach an agreement with regard to compensation has handicapped the government of the United States in its efforts to help Iran. There is a strong feeling in the United States, even among American citizens most sympathetic to Iran and friendly to the Iranian people, that it would not be fair to the American taxpayers for the United States government to extend any considerable amount of economic aid to Iran so long as Iran could have access to funds derived from the sale of its oil. I note the concern reflected in your letter at the present dangerous situation in Iran and sincerely hope that before it is too late, the government of Iran will take such steps as are in its power to prevent a further deterioration in that situation. This letter told Mosaddegh what Eisenhower's intimates already knew, that the new administration had reversed American policy toward Iran. No longer would there be efforts to make the best of the situation, as under Truman, and no longer would there be criticism of the British for favoring a coup. In fact, by the time Eisenhower sent his reply to Mosaddegh, both men knew what was afoot. Eisenhower had already given tacit approval to the coup plot, but because of its momentous scope, tacit approval was not enough. On June 14th, Alan Dulles went to the White House to brief him, sensing the President's desire not to know too much. Dulles gave him only what Kermit Roosevelt called the most broad-brush outline of what was proposed. That was all Eisenhower needed, and he gave his blessing. Around the same time, Churchill gave his own secret and much more enthusiastic approval. 
Planning for the plot was already quite advanced by the time Eisenhower and Churchill formally endorsed it. Two veteran intelligence officers, one American and one British, had met in Cyprus to draw up a detailed blueprint. Both were old both were old Iran hands. The CIA named the CIA man was Donald Donald Wilbur, who had worked for years as an archaeologist and an architect in the Middle East, served in Iran during World War II as an OSS agent, and then divided his time between advanced studies at Princeton and work as a consultant to the CIA specializing in psychological warfare. In 1952, Wilbur had spent six months running the CIA's political action office in Tehran, an assignment that gave him a first-hand view of political and military factions favoring and opposing Mossadegh. His British counterpart, Norman Derbyshire, had served extended tours of duty in Iran and worked closely with Robin Zainer. When the British intelligence station in Tehran was forced to close, it was moved to Cyprus and Derbyshire was named to head it. These two agents, now working for governments that shared the same goal in Iran, struck up a close working relationship as a CIA history of the coup, written by Wilbur himself, later reported. It soon became apparent that Dr. Wilbur and Mr. Derbyshire held quite similar views of Iranian personalities and had made very similar estimates of the factors involved in the Iranian political scene. There was no friction or marked difference of opinion during the discussions. It also quickly became apparent that the SIS was perfectly content to follow whatever lead was taken by the agency. It seemed obvious to Wilbur that the British were very pleasing to have, at having obtained the active cooperation at the agency and were determined to do nothing which might jeopardize U.S. participation. At the same time, there was faint envy expressed over the fact that the agency was better equipped in the way of funds, personal and f personnel, and facilities than was SIS. Wilbur and Derbyshire agreed that although General Zahedi had his weaknesses, he was the only Iranian with enough vigor and courage to rally opposition forces. Their plan to place him in power, which would be altered several times before the blow, the blow was struck, was carefully considered and straightforward. Through a variety of means, covert agents would manipulate public opinion and turn as many Iranians as possible against Mossadegh. This effort, for which $150,000 was budgeted, would create, extend, and enhance public hostility and distrust and fear of Mossadegh and his government. It would portray Mossadegh as corrupt, pro-communist, hostile to Islam, and bent on destroying the morale and readiness of the armed forces. While Iranian agents spread these lies, thugs would be paid to launch staged attacks on religious leaders and make it appear that they were ordered by Mossadegh or his supporters. Meanwhile, General Zahedi would persuade and bribe as many of his fellow officers as possible to stand ready for whatever military action was necessary to carry out the coup. He was to be given $60,000, later increased to 135000 to win additional friends and influence key people. Ay, ay, ay. A similar effort for which $11,000 per week was budgeted, would be launched to suborn members of the Mushlis. On the morning of coup day, thousands of paid demonstrators would, would stage a massive anti-government rally. The well-prepared Mushlis would respond with a quasi-legal vote to dismiss Mossadegh. If he resisted, army units under Zahedi's control would arrest him and his key supporters and then seize military command posts, police stations, telephone and telegraph offices, radio stations, and the National Bank. Working closely with comrades in Washington and Tehran, with whom they were in constant contact over a Cyprus-based radio network, Wilbur and Derbyshire finished this blueprint at the end of May. On June 3rd, Ambassador Henderson arrived in Washington to be briefed on its contents. He stayed to attend a crucial meeting on June 25th, at which plans for the coup were laid out in detail. President Eisenhower did not wish to hear details of covert operations, and so did not attend this meeting. His closest foreign policy advisors, however, were all there. The meeting was held in John Foster Dole's office at the State Department. When the plotters had assembled, Dole's picked up the report Wilbur and Derbyshire had written and said, So this is how we get rid of that madman, Mosedeg. Kermit Roosevelt explained how he had proposed to carry out the coup. And when, he fin and when he was finished, Dole's asked the others what they thought. Alan Dole's and Beetle Smith endorsed the plan without reservation. So did Secretary of Defense Charles Wilson. Two senior State Department officials, Henry Byrode, By By the Assistant Secretary for Middle East Affairs, and Robert Bowie, the Director of the Policy Planning Staff, went along with slightly less enthusiasm, certainly realizing that they would not remain in their jobs long if they dissented. When it was Henderson's turn to speak, he said he had no love for this kind of business, but that in this case we have no choice. 
That's that then, Secretary of State Dole said with an uncharacteristic grin. Let's get going. With this unanimous vote, the United States gave its final go-ahead for Operation Ajax, or Operation Boot, as the British continued to call it. The governments in London and Washington were finally united in their enthusiasm. One looked, fo one looked forward to recovering its oil concession. The other saw a chance to deliver a devastating blow against communism. There was dissent from this new unity. Some of it came from career diplomats like Charles Bolin, a former ambassador to the Soviet Union, who subjected one British diplomat in Washington to what the diplomat called an emotional tirade against the planned coup. Several CIA officers also opposed the idea. One of them was Roderick Gor Goran, the chief of the CIA station in Tehran. Goran had built a formidable intelligence network known by the codename Bidam that was engaged in propaganda activities aimed at blackening the image of the Soviet Union in Iran. It also stood ready to launch a nationwide campaign of subversion and sabotage in case of a communist coup. The Badam network consisted of more than 100 agents that had an annual budget of $1 million, quite considerable in light of the fact that the CIA's total worldwide budget for covert operations was just $82 million. Now Gor Goyran was being asked to use his network in a coup against Mossadegh. He believed that this would be a great mistake and warned that if the coup was carried out, Iranians would forever view the United States as a supporter of what he called Anglo-French col colonialism. His opposition was so resolute that Alan Dulles had to remove him from his post. While Alan Dulles marshaled, re marshaled resources for Operation Ajax, John Foster Dulles became its most enthusiastic cheerleader. He followed the preparations with delight and also great impatience. At one point, he became alarmed when Iran was discussed at a high-level meeting, but no mention was made of the planned coup. The next morning, he telephoned his brother at the CIA to ask anxiously whether something had gone wrong. According to a memo of their conversation, the Seki called and said, In your talk about Iran yesterday at the meeting, you did not mention the other matter. Is it off? AWD said he doesn't talk about it. It was cleared directly with the president and is still active. AWD said it is moving along reasonably well. Thus reassured that the plot was afoot, Secretary of State Dulles confined his public statements to generalized laments about the course of events in Iran. His comment at a news conference in July might have been read as a warning couched in highly diplomatic language. Recent developments in Iran, especially the growing activity of the illegal Communist Party, which appears to be tolerated by the Iranian government, have caused us concern, he said. These developments make it more difficult for the United States to give assistance to Iran so long as the government tolerates this sort of activity. By the time Kermit Roosevelt entered Iran in Jul on July 19th, the country was aflame. Mossadegh supporters in the Majlis had voted to remove Ayatollah Kashani, Kashani from his position as speaker. And the resulting clash led more than half, more than half the deputies to resign. Demonstrations demanding dissolution of the Majlis shook Tehran. Mossadegh announced that he would hold a referendum on the question and pledged to resign if voters did not vote to oust the existing Mashlis. The referendum, hurriedly convened at the beginning of August, was a disastrous parody of democracy. There were separate ballot boxes for yes and no votes, and the announced, and the announced result was over 99% in favor of throwing out the Mashlis. The transparent unfairness of this referendum was more, was more grist for the anti mossadegh mill. Mid-August found Roosevelt and his team of Iranian agents in place and ready to strike. They had pushed Iran to the brink of chaos. Newspapers and religious leaders were screaming for Mossadegh's head. Protests and riots organized by the CIA had turned the streets into battlegrounds. Anti-government propaganda, in Donald Wilbur's words, poured off the agency's presses and was rushed by air to Tehran. Mossadegh was isolated and weaker than ever. Against this background, Roosevelt had every reason to be confident when he sent Colonel Nasiri into action on August 15th. He had laid his plan so carefully that when he awoke the next day to find that his coup had failed, he decided to try again. Poor Mosedega. Have a good day, friends.